the early days of our republic, Americans watched Yankee clippers glide across the many oceans of the world, manned by proud and energetic individuals, showing our flag, breaking records for time and distance, opening up new vistas of commerce and communications. Well, today, I think you have helped recreate the anticipation of excitement felt in those home ports as those gallant ships were spotted on the horizon heading in after a long voyage. The fourth landing of the Columbia is the historical equivalent to the driving of the Golden Spike, which completed the first transcontinental railroad. It marks our entrance into a new era. The test flights are over. The groundwork has been laid. And now we will move forward to capitalize on the tremendous potential offered by the ultimate frontier of space. Thousands of civilians began pouring onto a military base located on a desert in the middle of summer, early on a Sunday morning. One could sense the day's events were going to be special. Spectators came to Edwards Air Force Base from all over the nation and all walks of life to celebrate the nation's 206th anniversary of independence and witness historical events more spectacular than the typical 4th of July fireworks display could ever hope to equal. The fourth landing of Space Shuttle Columbia, world's first reusable spacecraft. Columbia's first landing on a concrete runway, officially ending the orbital flight test program. Takeoff of the second orbiter in the shuttle fleet, Challenger, on its ferry flight to Kennedy Space Center, Florida, to be launched into space in the early part of 1983. And with shuttle pathfinder Enterprise as backdrop, the announcement of America's new space policy by President Ronald Reagan. Beginning with the next flight, the Columbia and her sister ship will be fully operational, ready to provide economical and routine access to space for scientific exploration, commercial ventures, and for tasks related to the national security. Simultaneously, we must look aggressively to the future by demonstrating the potential of the shuttle and establishing a more permanent presence in space. Our goals for space are ambitious yet achievable. We've only peered over the edge of our accomplishments. Surely, our accomplishments began with Columbia's first launch in April Looking back at that spectacular event and the performance of Space Shuttle during its first four flights, there seems little doubt now that it is a reliable, reusable space transportation system. When Columbia first arrived at Kennedy Space Center in March of 1979, there was some skepticism. Two factors were leading to major delays in the launch schedule. 
The quest to advance the state of the art in space technology, particularly in engine design and thermal protection, plus budgetary limitations imposed on development and testing of shuttle systems. With two-thirds of shuttle's tiles already on the vehicle, it was discovered that the bond was not strong enough to keep the tiles from falling off during high-stress phases of flight. The fix, called densification, required that most of the tiles be taken off, coated with the material to increase the bonding strength, then reapplied to the vehicle. The process took over one year to complete. But it worked. During the orbital flight test program, only undensified tiles showed weakness along their attach points on non-critical areas of the vehicle. Shuttle's main engines achieved the state-of-the-art in rocket engine technology. But as with any research and development program, confidence in the design came only after years of testing, learning, and some mistakes. Problems encountered during development of the engines were related to the unique requirements that had to be met. Reusability. Up to 55 flights with minimum maintenance. Ability to throttle down to 65%. Light weight yet the capability to withstand extremely high chamber pressure, pressure needed to generate the thrust for liftoff. Many failures that occurred were due to the tremendous pressures and vibration levels created trying to produce the needed thrust. But one by one, the problems were solved. The design was proven long before the first launch. Again. And again. And again. Four times within 15 months traveling over 8 million miles during the first four flights. Three hundred and fourteen revolutions around the Earth. Nineteen days on orbit. But beyond the statistics, a far more important goal was achieved with completion of the orbital flight test program. The foundation for our future was built, step by step, mission by mission. The goal of STS-1 was, quite simply, to get up and get down safely. Columbia, Houston, uh, you guys did so good, we're going to let you stay up there for a couple of days. You're going for on orbit. When astronauts John Young and Robert Crippen heard that announcement, they knew the mission was at least half a success. When returning from space, friction created by entering Earth's atmosphere blocks communication between mission control and the astronauts for 15 to 20 minutes. But it is also precisely during that time that temperatures on the vehicle surface reach their peak and shuttle structure undergoes its most stringent test. On Columbia's first flight, no one could predict exactly how shuttle would perform during that phase. 
Hello there. Houston, uh, Columbia's here. Hello, Columbia, Houston's here. How do you read? And we're done, uh, Mach 10. With voice contact reestablished, spacecraft and crew had safely passed through the most critical phase of entry. Landing was the final test. Flown as a glider, Columbia landed without power on the first and only attempt. Good coming. Go down. 50 feet. 40. 30. 20. 10. 5. 3. 2. 1. Down. Over here, 10 feet. Columbia's second flight was the first opportunity to evaluate the Canadian-built remote manipulator system. Manual functions were tested by astronauts Joe Engel and Richard Cooley. Automatic functions were computer controlled. The arm performed successfully in all operating modes. Preliminary thermal tests of the vehicle were also begun on flight two. One thermal attitude resulted in the payload bay being pointed toward Earth for extended periods of time. During those periods, a package of five Earth viewing instruments, designated OSTA-1, was activated. The package, composed of low-cost commercial-grade sensors previously flown only on aircraft, and instruments flown on individual satellites or past manned missions, collected the first Earth resource data using shuttle. The ability to mount all three types on Columbia greatly reduced the expense of acquiring the data. You want your okay. 100, 50, 30, 20, 10, 5, 3, touch 10. Go to your 15. Flight to crew, shuttle was truly a reusable space transportation system. Third flight of Columbia was primarily a thermal test of the vehicle, exposing it to the most extreme temperature differentials it could encounter on orbit during upcoming operational flights. No facility on Earth could simulate the same heating conditions Columbia would experience in the vacuum of space where temperatures could vary greatly from one end of the orbiter to the other, depending on its orientation to the sun. The thermal tests determined precisely what effect different attitudes had on shuttle structure. The vehicle suffered no adverse effects. Evaluation of the remote manipulator system continued on flight three. Astronauts Jack Lausman and Gordon Fullerton tested the system's payload handling capability. First order of business was unberthing. Although clearance around the payload was only two inches, Fullerton unberthed in just five minutes, much quicker than had been predicted pre-flight. Using the plasma diagnostics package, seven computer-controlled automatic movements of the arm were evaluated to prove scientific instruments could be maneuvered in and around the payload bay. Sally, uh, some general comments on the arm operation. The uh, operation is smooth. There's definitely a little bit of flex and dynamics, but uh, in the augmented modes, that's very minimized. Really, no surprises. Uh, if there are any surprises, they're all pleasant. Uh, I 
The plasma diagnostic package was one of ten instruments making up a scientific package on Flight 3 called OSS-1. Shuttle's movement through the ionosphere, electrical buildup on surfaces as it circled Earth, and electromagnetic interference between the ionosphere and electronic equipment on board were evaluated by the OSS-1 instruments to ensure that these phenomena would not adversely affect scientific instruments or sensitive astronomy observations on future shuttle flights. On flight four, the induced environment contamination monitor was used to check for contamination in and around the payload bay, created by cluster firings, outgassings, and water dumps. Eleven separate components of shuttle's induced environment were measured. The desk-sized monitor was the heaviest payload lifted by the remote manipulator system during the orbital flight test program. Thermal tests on the vehicle were completed during flight four. The first Department of Defense payload was on board. The spacesuit to be used for extravehicular activity on Flight 5 was tried on during Flight 4 to practice the procedure. And astronauts T.K. Mattingly and Henry Hartsfield conducted a thorough evaluation of on-orbit procedures for the upcoming operational era of space flight when Columbia will launch into Earth orbit on a routine basis. An ongoing task on all four missions of the flight test program was to evaluate living conditions on board shuttle. Items included food preparation, use of a food warmer, a freezer on board flight four, and eating in weightlessness. Personal hygiene tasks were evaluated. As were sleeping conditions. Use of sleep restraints. And a sleeping bag. Astronauts also evaluated the effects of exercise in zero G. This unique device, designed by a fellow astronaut, allowed the user to monitor his own heartbeat while jogging. Alternate methods of anchoring oneself in weightlessness were also appraised. schedules are forecast for upcoming shuttle flights when crews will be comprised of at least four people including women
Procedures on the ground are being streamlined for the operational era. Processing time was cut in half during the orbital flight test program. Presently, it takes approximately 13 weeks to prepare the space transportation system for launch. It is projected that by the mid-80s, there will be two shuttle launches per month. The number of people in mission control is gradually being reduced. Some positions have been eliminated. Others have been consolidated which represents a clear indication of confidence in Columbia's systems. While this monitoring is being streamlined, payload monitoring is increasing. A new area called the Payload Operations Control Center was activated during the orbital flight test program to give mission controllers, payload managers, and commercial users the opportunity to develop monitoring and data acquisition procedures for upcoming flights. Experiments in life sciences were carried on board Columbia during the orbital flight test program. A preliminary study of lignin growth in zero-g was conducted. Lignin is an indigestible skeletal substance which promotes strength and upward growth in woody plants. It is hoped that in the absence of gravity, woody plants might not need to produce as much lignin, and instead will produce more digestible nutrients, such as carbohydrates and protein. The effect of weightlessness on some flying insects, bees, moths, and flies was studied. The project, conceived by a high school student, was one of three experiments flown on Columbia as part of an annual science competition co-sponsored by NASA and the National Science Teachers Association. Equipment to process materials in zero gravity on future flights underwent initial testing during the orbital flight test program. The monodispersed latex reactor made polystyrene latex microspheres to determine if large, identical-sized latex microspheres could be manufactured practically and economically in space. Presently, large microspheres cannot be produced in uniform sizes on the ground. Yet medical and industrial applications have already been found in cancer research and treatment, glaucoma research, and for calibration standards in medical and scientific equipment. The continuous flow electrophoresis system built by McDonnell Douglas Corporation is a prototype of a production unit to purify material for the treatment of disease. The process separates substances according to their electrical charge. Hopefully, yields from the production unit will be high enough to make the product available to a mass market in the future. Results from the prototype's first flight show that a very thin, yet highly concentrated stream of protein substance on the left was separated from red dye on the right. The thin protein stream, only a portion of which is shown here, is actually over 43 inches long and is 300 to 400 times more concentrated than yields obtained from the same process on Earth. The continuous flow electrophoresis system represents the first commercial use of shuttle by private enterprise under a joint endeavor agreement between NASA, McDonnell Douglas Corporation, and Ortho Pharmaceuticals Corporation, a subsidiary of Johnson & Johnson. A unique opportunity to put small, self-contained payloads aboard shuttle on a space-available basis at a very low cost exists in the Getaway Special program. After proving its flight readiness on Flight 3, the Getaway Special was fitted with 10 experiments built by science students from Utah State University and flown on Flight 4. Deposits for Getaway Specials on future flights private enterprises' interest in flying payloads on board shuttle, missions planned into the next decade 
all reflect the confidence this nation has in the space transportation system. All objectives of the flight test program were achieved. Two of the most significant events were not planned. Just prior to the third launch, tons of landing and recovery equipment had to be transported from California to New Mexico, a 1,000-mile journey, because heavy rains in California prevented a landing there. An entire encampment had to be built at the New Mexico landing site, Northrop Strip, and the task had to be completed within four days. Just prior to landing on the same mission, only one and a half hours before touchdown, an unexpected sandstorm blew into the area. As you could probably surmise, the winds have been coming up all day. Uh, it was still acceptable until uh, his last pass, but during uh, John's last pass, the uh, visibilities were unacceptable and the turbulence was severe. So it's not a good day, and we're going to wave off for 24 hours. Over. Plans were implemented immediately to stay on orbit an extra 24 hours. We had a good drill. The flexibility to remain on orbit until weather conditions improve and land at an alternate strip could not have been demonstrated by previous spacecraft. Only the shuttle has that capability. It meets a need, providing access to low Earth orbit on a routine basis. by launching on time. Serving as a platform for Earth observation and space observation. Deploying payloads. Operating in extreme temperature differentials while on orbit. Providing ample living accommodations for astronaut crews. Landing on lake beds. Four concrete runways. As President Reagan said, the end of the orbital flight test program marks our entrance into a new era. The test flights are over. The groundwork has been laid. Now we will move forward to capitalize on the tremendous potential offered by the ultimate frontier of space. Deliver the crew of Shuttle Mission 5 did. Only eight hours into the first operational flight of the Space Shuttle program. Fifth flight of the orbiter Columbia. The first four missions were test flights. 
to prove the space transportation system could provide access to low Earth orbit on a routine basis. Those missions laid the groundwork for the operational era. Shuttle Flight 5 was the beginning of that era. The primary purpose of the mission, to carry two communication satellites into orbit, deploy them from the payload bay, then return to Earth. Columbia, Houston, 30 seconds till LOS, and everything is still go down here for deploy. Mr. Brian, we copy that. Thank you very much. We're looking forward to having a good one. Roger, and good luck. A flawless landing, only minutes after sunrise at Edwards Air Force Base, California, ended Columbia's fifth mission. Looking slightly weathered, the orbiter had traveled over ten and a half million miles in five flights, spent 24 days on orbit, and circled the Earth almost 400 times. It would now return to Kennedy Space Center, Florida, for refurbishment, to be launched again on Shuttle Flight 9. The newest orbiter in NASA's fleet, Challenger, would fly on Shuttle Flight 6. Many weight-saving improvements had been made. The orbiter itself was almost 2,500 pounds lighter because of structural changes. The external tank weighed 10,000 pounds less than the one used on Shuttle Flight 1. The solid rocket boosters were almost 4,000 pounds lighter. The three main engines were upgraded to 104% of rated thrust. A blanket-like thermal material replaced 600 thermal tiles in non-critical areas. And all 30,000 tiles were densified to improve their durability. This stack could carry over 17,000 pounds more into orbit than Columbia. Minus 15, 14, 13, 12, 11, 10, we'll go for main engine ignition. Seven, six, we have main engine ignition. And liftoff, liftoff of the Orbiter Challenger and the sixth flight of the space shuttle. On Shuttle Flight 6, Challenger's cargo, the tracking and data relay satellite, TDRS, and its solid propellant inertial upper stage rocket, the IUS, weighed almost 19 tons. TDRS was the largest, most advanced communication satellite launched to date. That is correct. A major accomplishment in space communications. TDRS is launched from the payload bay by ejection springs released when explosive bolts are fired. After shuttle moves a safe distance away, the first stage of the IUS rocket fires to boost the satellite from 150 miles to 22,300 miles in altitude. Then the first stage separates. Shortly thereafter, the second stage of the IUS rocket fires to circularize the satellite's orbit. Solar panels and antennas are deployed to provide power 
and tracking and data relay capability. Having attained a circularized altitude of 22,300 miles and traveling at the same speed as the Earth's rotation, the satellite will remain fixed in orbit over the same location continuously. Later, the first TDRS will be joined by two more identical satellites. The three will form a space communications network, providing almost continuous coverage to Earth orbiting spacecraft, not the 15% ground stations provide. The network will be able to track 26 Earth orbiting spacecraft simultaneously. And because TDRS satellites only relay data, they do not process it, 20 times more information will be handled by this network than could be by ground stations. All data will be relayed directly to the primary NASA ground terminal, White Sands, New Mexico, and from there via domestic satellite to other NASA centers. Launch of TDRS was on time and nominal. First stage firing of the inertial upper stage also went well. And Sunnyvale and White Sand send you a special attaboy. However, halfway through the second stage firing, ground controllers lost communication with the satellite. It was an hour before even intermittent signals were picked up. They indicated TDRS had not yet separated from the IUS and that both were tumbling at a very high rate of speed. Receiving only intermittent signals from TDRS, using short-life batteries which would soon be depleted, and getting no response to signals sent from the ground, made the outlook for TDRS bleak. Several more hours passed, and then something remarkable happened. Experts still aren't sure why, but either an automatic timing mechanism was engaged, or onboard systems finally acknowledged repeated commands from the ground separating TDRS from the IUS. Now on its own, the satellite stopped tumbling. Ground controllers commanded deployment of the solar array and antennas. However, they quickly learned TDRS was way off course and drifting farther every day. Their only hope of getting it back on course was to use the tiny hydrazine thrusters originally designed for minor attitude and velocity adjustments, not for boosting the two and a half ton TDRS over 8,500 miles farther into space. But at least the satellite was not lost. NASA officials immediately put their plan into effect. Meanwhile, Shuttle Flight 6 continued as planned. Okay, we're back with you, Milo, for about 12 more minutes. Got a good TV picture again. Roger, Houston. Got the hatch closed, and we're waiting for a go for deep rest on time. That sounds great, Bo. Copy, we have a go for deep rest on time. That's affirmative, you have a go. Challenger uses with you over Guam for about seven and a half minutes. Roger, hatch is open. EV-1 is uh, halfway out. They're configuring the airlock, getting ready for Don to come out. Okay, we're watching. We're watching. Ethan, uh, still have a suggested setting for the DAC camera down with the sunlight. Okay, Don. This was America's first spacewalk in nine years. The astronauts were attached by safety tethers to slide wires running just inside the payload bay. They wore a new design in spacesuits, also called extravehicular mobility units. A portable life support system was worn on the back, eliminating the need for a lifeline connected to the orbiter. These suits are not custom built for each astronaut. Tops and bottoms of different sizes can be mixed. They are also more flexible than previous space suits. The crew removed tools from a storage locker in the front part of the payload bay.
then moved aft again. Using a cable run through a winch mounted on the bulkhead, then tied to the cradle that had held the IUS, the astronauts demonstrated they could have lowered the cradle manually had commands from on board failed. Winch operations were tested on the front bulkhead using an exergeny as a load to see how many pounds the winch and line could handle. Lastly, the tools were restowed, and the astronauts re-entered the spacecraft. Perhaps the most visually spectacular mission since America's first landing on the moon, Shuttle Flight 7 gave us our first glimpse of the orbiter from a distance. Another space first. John, we have had uh, one more of those intermittent dropouts, but uh, the spas came right back up and uh, no other problems. Thank you. The magnificent views were provided by a European payload called SPAS. SPAS is an acronym for Shuttle Pallet Satellite, a unique reusable space platform built by the West German aerospace company Messerschmitt Balkov Blom, with generous financial assistance from the West German Federal Ministry of Research and Technology. In addition to having American television and film cameras mounted on spas, 10 experiments belonging to the West German government, the European Space Agency, and NASA were on the platform. MBB wanted to validate the satellite's design and prove experiments could be operated while spas was free flying. NASA wanted to show the remote manipulator system could handle the two and a half ton payload. The orbiter's ability to station keep with spas was also demonstrated. At this point, they are 1,000 feet apart. Here, spas and Challenger are 200 feet apart. Thrusters on board the orbiter were fired to record the effect on spas. Spas was rebirthed for return to Earth. The remark by Shuttle Flight 7's commander meant not only had the SPAS operation been successful, but that the crew also deployed two communication satellites. A Canadian satellite to be used for one of the world's first direct-to-home pay TV services, and an Indonesian satellite. It would increase high-speed data transmission and telecommunication service to that country's remote island locations. Roger, uh, the weather at KSC is getting worse instead of getting better, so it looks like we're a no-go for KSC. Shuttle Flight 7 was to be the first landing of an orbiter at Kennedy Space Center, Florida. But bad weather conditions did not allow it. Challenger would touch down instead at Edwards Air Force Base, California, the alternate landing site. Roger. During the period of communications blackout, usually lasting about 15 minutes, 
temperatures on the vehicle's surface reach their peak. The temperature of the red-hot glow seen through Challenger's front windows was about 2400 degrees Fahrenheit. One astronaut described the view as like being inside a furnace. Processing Western Test Range data. Approximately two months after Tidrus was first launched from Shuttle's cargo bay on Flight 6, the final firing needed to place the satellite in its correct orbit was executed. Copy. Go ahead for the burns. Personnel began immediately to check out communication systems on board and initiate a series of important ground tests with the satellite essential to its operation on upcoming shuttle flights. First use of Tedris with shuttle was on mission eight. Challenger Houston with you on Tedris. Houston Challenger loud and clear. How do you read the CDR? Roger, loud and clear also. Challenger, this is Houston with you through Hawaii for seven. Also minutes. conducted on shuttle flight eight was check out of the remote manipulator system and payload flight test article. The 8,500-pound structure was the heaviest object lifted by the arm to date, more than double the weight of any previous payload. Data gathered during the checkout was used to plan the Solar Max repair mission. On that flight, a 20,000-pound payload would be deployed, and an orbiting satellite would be retrieved. Flight 8 marked the sixth successful launch of a satellite by shuttle. It was an Indian communications satellite which would bring telecommunications, television, and badly needed weather information to remote areas of that country. Because Challenger was launched at night on shuttle flight 8, Parts of the southern hemisphere never seen or photographed from space were visible during daylight hours. The first night landing for the space shuttle program occurred on Mission 8 with safe touchdown of Challenger at Edwards Air Force Base, California. After making its first voyage into space on Shuttle Flight 4, the Continuous Flow Electrophoresis System, Cephas, flew again on Shuttle Flights 6, 7, and 8. The device is a prototype of a production unit to purify material for the treatment of disease. It was built by McDonnell Douglas Corporation and flown on shuttle as part of a joint agreement between NASA, McDonnell Douglas Corporation, and Ortho Pharmaceuticals Corporation, a subsidiary of Johnson & Johnson. 
Combined results from Flight 6 and 7 demonstrated that Cephas could separate over 700 times more material and impurities four times higher than could be achieved in Earth's gravity. Shuttle Flight 8 was the first use of Cephas to separate living cells. Some of the samples were separated to continue research at Pennsylvania State University and Johnson Space Center, Texas. The McDonnell Douglas samples were used to further diabetes research at Washington University Medical School, Missouri. Other scientific activity conducted on shuttle flights 5 through 8 also focused, as the Cephas had, on research and materials processing, greatly enhanced when performed in the weightlessness of space. The monodispersed latex reactor flown on shuttle flights 3 and 4 flew again on missions 6 and 7 in a continuing attempt to improve the production of polystyrene latex microspheres for cancer research and treatment and glaucoma research. Five student experiments flew on the four shuttle flights as part of an annual science competition co-sponsored by NASA and the National Science Teachers Association. Studies ranged from fluid convection to sponge and crystal growth to biofeedback. A total of 23 getaway special canisters were flown on shuttle flights 5, 6, 7, and 8. Some contained stamped envelopes from the U.S. Post Office commemorating spaceflight. Others grew snow, exposed seeds to zero gravity, and studied the effects of weightlessness on a colony of ants. NASA's Getaway Special Program is a unique opportunity to fly small, self-contained payloads on board shuttle on a space-available basis at a very low cost. Perhaps the studies with the most human interest were those done on space adaptation syndrome, also known as space motion sickness, a malady which affects approximately half of all astronauts. The most extensive studies of SAS were done on Flight 8, focusing primarily on the neurological system. Aural sensitivity was tested, eye movements, and repeated physical motion. Measurements were taken of limb volume and external tissue pressure. If any of these tests looked torturous, it's no wonder the crew dubbed the doctor's mid-deck working area a chamber of horrors, and mockingly gave him a taste of his own medicine Astronaut crews got along exceedingly well with each other on missions 5, 6, 7, and 8. Yet they were the largest, most diverse crews in the history of spaceflight. Flight 5 carried the first four-person crew. Flight 6, calling themselves the Over the Hill Gang, tallied up all their years of experience to get this grand total. Flight 7 carried the first five-person crew including the first American woman to fly in space, Sally Ride. Flight 8 included the first black American to fly in space, Guyane Bluford. And the oldest person to fly in space to date, Dr. William Thornton. With ejection seats gone from the flight deck, and water storage tanks and instrumentation gone from the mid-deck, there was much more room to accommodate the larger crews. There was also opportunity for privacy, exercise, and as usual on any important trip, plenty of food. The success of flights five, six, seven, and eight represented many accomplishments for the space shuttle program. More importantly, the missions prove the operational capability of the space transportation system, that useful work can be done in space for the benefit of people on Earth. But the program has really just begun. Third orbiter in the shuttle fleet, Discovery, will be launched in 1984. The fourth orbiter, Atlantis, will be ready for use in 1985. New astronauts are being recruited. 
73 shuttle flights are scheduled through 1988. The outlook for the future of America's space shuttle program is excellent. And there appears to be no end in sight.